susceptible to these things. <laughs> uh, well, but I might not remember who who said who. You know. So if you want to get it in writing, you should send me an email, you know, so that I have your name. I know who buttered me up. And <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, and I really am interested, you know, you're, you're the second class that this has been tried out on. Um, a friend of mine tried it out on his class, his, uh, you know, a similar class, first year graduate students um, in the University of Connecticut. So um, I don't mean first year, I mean first semester of this stuff. So uh, I really am interested in what you, what you think. And there are parts of it that just seem very confusing. Um, you know, please let me know, because the goal is to be as transparent as possible. If it's confusing, then there's a good chance it's our fault as the writers and not your fault as the reader. So start by assuming that and let me know what parts were thorny. <coughs> OK, so I want to talk about, uh, we're, we're still on Max Cut. I'm sorry, Max Flow. Max flow min cut. So we're still talking about max flow. <coughs> so again, let's let's take this example here, where the capacity. Um, here's the the source. Here's the destination. The capacities <coughs> look like this. And. Um, now I'm going to if this is my if, if G is my original graph and W of E is the I guess we should call it C of E for capacity instead of weight. If C of E is the capacity of a graph in the original of an edge in the original network, then let's say that my current flow, so this is the capacity. Let's say that my current flow is f of e, okay, the flow I've found so far. So the idea is to define a residual graph with residual capacities. So in particular, 
C prime of E will be the leftover capacity on each edge, C of E minus F of E. <coughs> and um, now clearly, uh, well, okay, so let, let's, let, let's, let's look at this example where <coughs> the flow I use takes, so two students go along this edge using its entire capacity. They split up there. One of them goes this way. The other goes that way using half of the capacity of this edge. <coughs> One goes this way. <coughs> and then these two join at that city and go this way using the entire capacity of that edge. So my residual graph now looks like this. There's a zero there, a one there, one there, zero, zero. <coughs> so the problem is that we know that this isn't the best flow. Okay? We know that the best flow is to send two across the top, two across the bottom, and to ignore the one along the middle completely. So we want to get from this flow to this one. <coughs> and not use this edge at all. Okay? This flow has value three, this one has value four. Now, a simple case of improving a flow is if among these residual capacities, there's some path from S, to C, from S to T where every link in the path has some leftover capacity. Right? Then you just add more flow there, and you have a better flow. But this is a trickier situation, <coughs> or at least it seems trickier. Because there isn't actually any path of leftover capacity here, and yet there is an improvement. So if this is my optimal flow, and this is my current flow, there's still a way to describe getting from here to here by increasing the flow along a path, sort of. But what path is that? Yeah, so what we want to do is add flow here and sort of push back the flow there, cancel the previous flow we had, and then add more flow here. So now these two would cancel. Okay. So <coughs> now. This, that was not a path through this graph because of this reverse edge. But maybe, so maybe in defining our residual graph, we should include some reverse edges. So this edge goes forward and has residual capacity one because there's a seat available. So I could increase the flow along that edge if I want. This reverse edge means I could also change the flow by removing the flow I already have there. So what capacity in the residual graph should this edge have? How much can I change the flow there? The original flow. Sorry? The original. Yeah, whatever my current flow is, I could increase the flow in the opposite direction by which I mean cancel out the flow I have there. The flow can't go negative, so I can't cancel out more than I already have. So I will also define reverse edges uh, let's see do I give the reverse edges a name? What did, did I give them did I call them something? Or should I just call them reverse edges? Um, yeah, okay. So I'll call a reverse edge, let's call it E bar. In fact, I think that's a good name for it here. <laughs> so a reverse edge just goes the opposite direction and we'll define 
its residual capacity, which I guess in the book I call C sub f, because it's the residual capacity is a function of the flow you have. And its capacity is equal to whatever flow you currently have forward. Okay. So now my new graph looks like this. <coughs> There are other reverse edges as well, but I'm not going to draw them. It would make everything messy, and I'm not going to use them. Okay. So now this graph has both kinds of edges, edges where I can increase the flow and edges where I can decrease the flow. And now in this graph, this improvement that changes this non-optimal flow that I had before to the optimal flow can be represented by a path of non-zero capacities from the source to the destination. <coughs> so by including these reverse edges, I allow myself to undo mistakes. Right? Remember before I talked about, well, you know, a greedy algorithm is one where you never have to backtrack. There's never any danger that a step you take is a bad will turn out later to be a bad step. Well, it, if I don't have these reverse edges, then in that sense, um, greedy doesn't work very well because I could start with this uh, sending one student that way, and then another student that way, and then I could say, hey, you know, I can get another student there doing this. <coughs> but now I get stuck if I don't have reverse edges. So remember what I said last time about how, you know, the shape of the landscape depends on what moves you allow yourself. If I don't include these reverse edges in the improvements I can do, then it's possible to get stuck in the local optimum. The landscape is bumpy. But if I somewhat expand the types of moves I'm allowed to do so that I'm allowed to add this path, which means canceling this one, now the landscape becomes a nice smooth mountain. Now I can never get stuck. I haven't proved that yet. Next thing to do is to prove that. Okay. So, um, so here is the theorem that we're going to state. So, so the idea is, um, you know, given a graph G uh, with these capacities and this current flow, define a new weighted graph G prime with this residual capacity, but also with these reverse edges with this residual capacity. Okay. So now I'm going to state the following theorem. The flow F is optimal if and only if there is no path from S to T in G prime or I, I, I'm sorry, I guess in the book I said G sub F, not G prime, along edges with non-zero C sub F. Okay. So now notice if this theorem is true, you have your algorithm. Because how can I tell whether there is a path from S to T along these edges? You can just do uh, reachability or something. That's reachability. And we already know how to solve reachability. So we just run our favorite reachability algorithm as a subroutine. So in, in other words, given the original graph and the current flow, you can easily, easily calculate these things and then just run reachability on it. Either there's a path or there isn't. I claim that if reachability says no, there's no path, you're done. You output the current flow and say, here's the optimal flow. If there is a path, you can now modify the flow by sending more flow along that path. You now have a better flow. You recalculate the residual graph. Do it all again. 
So at every step, you either learn that your current solution is the best possible, or you learn a way to improve it, <coughs> which is a fantastic situation to be in. And one which we certainly do not have for most optimization problems. So there's one thing left before proving, I mean, we're not, besides proving this, even if you believe this, we haven't quite proved that this whole algorithm runs in polynomial time. Why not? How many times? Exactly. I mean, you know, what if it takes us many, many of these improvement steps to get to the optimal one? So more about that later. But for now, let's just notice that in polynomial time, we can tell our current solution is optimal, or we can see a way to improve it. Okay, which is great if we can prove this theorem. Did you have a, another question? Yeah, I was just wondering if you don't have n squared amount of uh, reverse edges at each step of the algorithm. I mean, at, at each step of this of this um, this backtracking process, you would potentially have all n squared number of reverse edges which you have to consider. Well, the reverse edges only go. The question is, do we get order n squared reverse edges after we do this several times? So, I mean, the reverse edges only go backwards along the original edges of the graph. So, if the original, <coughs> if the original graph had order n squared edges, then yes, we could. But we'll have at most twice that many, right? Including the, the reverse edges. Okay, so let's prove this. So, um, you know, we, we've sketched a couple proofs in class, but maybe we should really do one, especially because I think the whole thing about minimum spanning tree, you'd, you, most of you had seen in previous classes, so maybe repeating the formal proof wasn't necessary. But let's let's really prove this. Okay. So first, let's show that if there is a path in GF along edges with non-zero capacity, then F is not optimal. How do I prove that? Yes? Sure. Do I need to rewrite this? Okay, this says if there is a path in GF, then F is not optimal. So we're trying to prove this. Why is this the case? Still can always add a pass and increase the flow by one. Right. You can you can always increase the flow, you know, by one or even or maybe more than one, but in any case at least by one. And in order to just let to nail this down, let, let me let me just state very clearly what the restrictions on a flow are. <coughs> so, what are the constraints on the flow? Well, first of all, we can't have negative flows. Okay. Secondly, the total flow in and out of any V other than the source and destination is zero. Okay. No students get left or picked up at the airports. And then also F of E is less than or equal to the capacity. Okay. So when I add flow along a path in GF, I'm, I'm clearly increasing the total flow out of S and into T. We just need to make check that all of these conditions are still satisfied, that it is still a legal flow. Well, is this one still satisfied? Yeah. On the forward edges, it is because we're only adding flow. Yeah. On the reverse edges, it is because Can the capacity of the reverse edges is only the flow I have. So the most I can cancel out is the flow I already have there. Okay. Finally, is this true? Well, on the reverse edges, if I add flow, I'm decreasing the flow. So I'm only making this more true. And on the forward edges, is this also true? Yes, because I defined the capacity as C of E minus F of E. So if there's some wiggle room in here, I can add 
flow and this constraint is still satisfied. So we didn't write all of that down. Uh, I hope I, I said it in large enough letters. Um, ha ha, sorry, okay. Um, so, you know, proof of this part, because if we add, you know, let's, let's call this path delta. If we add one unit of flow along delta, then all the constraints are still true. But the value, the total flow, has increased by one. OK? All right. So we've proved it in one direction. Well, this was the easy direction. So what we, the hard direction is to prove the converse, that if there is no path in G sub F, then your flow really is optimal, that there's no way to improve it. So continuing the proof, because we want to prove if and only if, conversely, suppose F is not optimal, okay? Well, let, um, let, let's see, let delta here, I, I should probably try to use the same, well, okay. So let F be the optimal flow, whatever it is, okay? So now let me define a new flow, which is the difference, okay? On each edge, I have f prime of e minus f of e. Okay. So I claim that this is a flow in G sub f, a, a legal flow. Okay, with whose value is non-zero. Its value is non-zero because the total value of f prime is supposed to be greater than the total value of f. So if I subtract one from the other, you know, overall, more students are getting through than before. So there's an overall flow from s to t. I'm not saying the result is a legal flow in the original graph g, because in our example here, it isn't, right? Mm -hmm. So the point is that if this is the optimal flow, f prime, and this is f, our current flow, well then, f prime minus f looks like this. One minus one, one, zero and zero. Okay, let's stare at this for a moment. So the idea is that there are anti-students, <laughs> and student antiparticles. Okay, so here it's like saying, you know, you've all read enough pop physics books to know that from out of the vacuum can emerge a particle and an antiparticle in a pair, and then they can annihilate each other. So leaving out the gamma rays, the point is that, you know, here this sort of Negative flow happens, created in a pair with a positive flow. Here it cancels out, but there's an overall flow from left to right. Well, the point is that um, on each of these edges, if it's a positive flow, then it is a flow in G sub F, right? Yeah. I'm sorry, th th then it's a flow along the forward edges that were in the original graph, okay? And it's less than or equal to the capacity because, well, it's less than f prime, less than or equal to f prime, and f prime was at most the capacity. Okay. And of course, this kind of negative flow along one of the original edges, we can think of as a positive flow 
along this reverse edge. How do we know that it's less than or equal to the capacity C sub F? Well, we're told that the capacity of the reverse edges is just F of E, and so the point is that F prime minus F is greater than or equal to minus F, so the reverse flow is less than or equal to F, which is less than or equal to this capacity. So, I mean, I, do you think you could reproduce, the, even, if, even if some of this went by a little quickly, do you think you could reproduce the argument? Do you at least see the claims that are being made? So I want to point out that if F is a legal flow and F prime is another legal flow, the difference between them still obeys this, right? Because zero minus zero is zero. The total flow in and out is still zero. So um, it's just that some of the flows might be negative, so, but that's taken care of with the reverse edges. So, check to see if you believe this claim, if you don't already. Of course, you know, you shouldn't just believe it because I'm standing up here saying that I proved it. Make sure you can prove it yourself if you didn't follow along completely. But in the meantime, are there any, are there any questions about the proof? Okay, so, <coughs> checking whether or not it's optimal is it's pretty easy, but actually finding F prime is still tricky. The point is you're going to find F prime, right? So the point is F prime is out there somewhere. And um, you know that each time you ask, each time you calculate the residual graph and its capacities, and you ask, is, S, is there a path from S to T? Um, you know, each time you do that, you either learn you have found the optimal solution or you learn a way to improve your solution, which means you're taking a step towards optimality. Okay. So I'm going to keep showing, the algorithm will keep showing you ways to improve your flow until it is the best possible. So the point is we don't need to know what F prime is for this argument to work. We're just saying if there is any flow out there which is better than ours, then then there is a flow in G sub F. Oh, and I, and I forgot to say the following thing. Clearly, there's no flow in G sub F from S to T unless there is at least a path of edges with non-zero capacity from S to T. If there's no way to get there, there's no way to push any flow through. Well, yes? Uh, so F, the F prime minus F, it, it, it satisfies the satisfies the requirements in your plant, but uh, it doesn't uh, necessarily make sure that uh, it is a flow, because it uh, may be some circles. Um, circles can happen. So for instance, in our, in our residual <coughs> graph, so um, let's take a slightly different example. So, well, let's see. Yeah, so let's start with this thing here. And now, um, let's say that, let me see. Well, okay. Uh, if I say too much more, I'm actually going to give away one of the homework problems. <laughs> so there is such a thing as a circular flow, okay? Yes, but it's not such but, Well, the point is, though, that if F prime has a higher value, a, a higher total flow out of S and into T than F does, well, the total flow out of S in F prime minus F will be non-zero. Yes. 
So it will be a flow, you know, with non-zero value. Now, you could have a flow that looks like this. You know, you have a bunch of people going here, a bunch of people going there, and a bunch of people going around in a circle. <laughs> okay, that is a legal flow. This part isn't very useful because, well, it's costing your advisor money to buy the plane tickets and it's not getting anyone from S to T. But it is, it is legal. Okay. And it is possible that F prime minus F has loops like this in it. Um, uh, you know, you could even have a little loop where two go here and then they split up and then they rejoin there and they do that over and over again. But what matters is that, well, you know, there is still a way to get more flow from one end to the other. All right? Any other questions? So we still have this outstanding issue, though. So we have, this, we have this very nice situation where I either learn that my current solution is optimal or I learn a way to improve it. And then I apply that improvement by find, using reachability in GF to find out this path and then adding flow along it. Um, the question is, how many times will I have to do this improvement? If each improvement kind of makes a very small difference, and I need to do an exponential number of improvements before I reach the optimum, well then, this is still not a polynomial time algorithm. Even though each of these individual steps that tells us whether the current solution is optimal or not can be done in polynomial time. Right? I also want the total number of these improvements to be polynomial. So now it behooves us to think a little bit about the, the weights and the problem. So clearly, uh, so w w one, one thing that maybe I should have said is that we're assuming that all the weights are integers. Okay. Now, if you do have this path, delta of non-zero capacities, well, you can, you can uh, always pump one unit along it, since the non-zero capacity is at least one. But in general, what's the, mo what's the largest flow that I could add along delta? So let's say that I have delta and this edge has capacity three, this one has capacity two, this is capacity seven, this is capacity four. The smallest, the smallest, the smallest one. one, right. So the smallest one is like the bottleneck that controls how much I can push through. Okay. So, um, well, so I want to say two things. One is if the weights, or the, the, the capacities, sorry, if the capacities are themselves polynomial, then this whole thing works in polynomial time. Why is that? <laughs> Sorry? You improve at least one. <coughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's, n, let's say there's n vertices. Let's be generous. There are n squared edges. Every one of them has, you know, whatever polynomial you have here, if it's n to the 10th capacity, well, the most flow you could possibly put in then is n to the 12th, I guess. And you start out with zero and you improve by one at each time if all the capacities are integers. So, I mean, you just hit the maximum conceivable capacity in polynomial time. But in the natural way to define this problem, do we know that the capacities are polynomial? How would I, in general, how would I, how would I email you this problem? An example of the problem. In what format would I send it to you? Graph. A graph and? Sorry? An adjacency matrix. An adjacency matrix and, and in each adjacency, in each entry? The, way the, the, the capacity or the weight and and in what format? Number. Digit. It's an integer written, you know, so the number of digits 
is going to be at most, say, n. But that means that the actual capacities could be exponentially large, yeah. OK? Because they're n-digit numbers. Um, and so uh, a priori, this could take an exponential number of improvements. So I will state, but not prove, the following. You can find it in lots of books and on the web, and I could have assigned it to you as a homework, and I thought about it, but then I decided not to. So, what, so it turns out, theorem, that if at each step, the path that you increase the flow on is the shortest path from S to T, And if we add as much flow as possible, which is the minimum of the residual capacities of the edges in delta, um, then, then a polynomial number of improvements suffice to get to up to the optimal flow even if the weights are even if the capacities are exponentially large integers um, so I, I won't prove that it, it's a nice it's a nice fact I mean the point is that what are we worried about right we have these exponentially large capacities we're worried about oh here's a little wiggly path let's add one Oh, look, here's another little wiggly path. Let's add one, and so on. And we take all these teeny tiny steps toward the optimal flow. Well, you know, let's get down to business. Find the shortest path and add as much capacity as you can. It turns out that when you do that, you take big steps towards the optimal flow, and the polynomial number of steps always suffices. Um, so, but I'm not going to prove it unless somebody really wants to know. It's, it's not too hard. Um, basically, what you do is you bound the number of times that a given edge, in, that the flow along a given edge increases. And you show that each edge will only have its flow increased a polynomial number of times. There's a polynomial number of edges. So the total number of improvements will be polynomial. Wow. That's how it works. All right. So, having done all this, I, uh, I want to explain this thing I said last time about the duality between max flow and min cut. So remember, the, the problem in min cut is someone wants to prevent us from getting from S to T. They're going to choose a certain number of edges and buy up all the available seats on those flights so that there is no way left. And, and I would like to um, use a, cert, a slightly different example. So let's say that here I have two and two. Here's one. 1 and 1, and here's 2 and 2. Well, you can see the optimal flow, right? And how many, how, what's the total number we can get there? 3. three. Right, so we're, we're going to use all of these. Unfortunately, there'll be one unused seat there and one unused seat there. Okay? And clearly, if our uh, academic rival wants to cut off our access to this conference, the right thing for him to do is to cut the graph here. When he does that, he, he pays three units to buy those three edges, and now there's no path. OK? Yes? Does it always have to be a planar cut, or can it be some weird cut? Oh, I don't, just because I'm drawing in the whiteboard, I don't mean to imply that these are planar graphs. So formally, um, a cut is a subset S of V where V is the set of vertices. Okay. And let's call T 
everything other than S, such that the source is in S and the destination is in T, so they're in different subsets. So in this case, here's the subset S, and here's the subset T, and the weight of the cut is the sum of, you know, the weight or capacity C of E over all edges that cross from S to T. Okay, all of those where their first endpoint is in S and their second endpoint is in T. Right. Now, last time we talked about the fact that the value of the max flow Hello. is less than or equal to the value of the min cut. Now, with this picture, you know, I think what we said is a little clearer. The point is that it's actually less than the, it's actually less than or equal to the value of any cut. Yeah. Okay. That's because if there's any way to divide the vertices into a group capital S that includes S and capital T that includes T, well, all the students have to get from capital S to capital T. So at some point, they have to cross this interface. The most we could possibly ask for is if every single one of these edges is completely saturated by our flow, as it is in this example, okay? And so there's no way that we can get a flow greater than the weight of that cut. And since this is true for any cut, it's also true for the min cut, okay? So again, every cut is an upper bound on the flow. The minimum cut is the lowest upper bound, the tightest upper bound. Now, let's prove that these are actually equal. Well, again, the, the only way I know how to solve that, I mean, maybe there's some other proofs out there, but the simplest way I know how to prove that they're equal is to use the algorithm that we just proved works, okay? To use the theorem that we proved. So recall that what we proved in that theorem, if F is the max flow, then there is no path along edges of non-zero residual capacity in GF from S to T, okay? And indeed, in this case, on um, the residual graph, what does it look like? Well, there's one, one seat available there, one left here. All the forward edges, all these others are completely used. There's a bunch of reverse edges, but the rever you know we could draw them if you like, but they're not going to help us get this way from S to T. They all go the other way. Okay? Well, if there's no way to get from little s to little t in GF, then what's a reasonable way to divide the vertices into two groups, one of which includes little s and the other of which includes little t? Well, I'll just... What about the, the reachable set of S and the reachable set of zeros? Yeah. Well, there's actually there's actually multiple ways to do it. So what one is one is to say, well, what is all what is the set of all vertices that you can reach from little s in GF? Yeah. Which here is just this. And then we could say T is everything else. Okay. At least one set has to be at edge capacity one. 
Uh, yeah, well, actually, remember, T and S are supposed to be complements. Yes, so, right. so another way to do it is let capital T be the places, all the places you can reach little t from, which is just this, and let S be everything else. Well, there are multiple choices, and these correspond to different cuts with the same weight, as it turns out. So for instance, in this case, the weight, remember, the capacity here was 2, and that was 1. And indeed, one of the minimal cuts is to take this edge and this edge. That has total weight 3. Another is to take these three, as we did before. Yet another is to take this one and this one, which corresponds to saying that this is capital T and the rest of the world is capital S. And that also has a total weight of one because this was two and this was one. All right. Well, we haven't proved, though. So we haven't, we're not quite done with the proof. I claim that, so let S be the set of vertices reachable from little s in g sub s <coughs> and let t be everything else. So I claim that I claim the weight of this cut, which is the total capacity from S to T is mm, well, I claim that that equals the value of F, which we assumed was maximal. Why is that? Well, the value of the flow is the total number of students that get out of little s. Okay? It's also the total number of students that get into t. But more generally, you can draw any circle around s, any set of vertices, and then the total number of students flowing out of there is the flow. And because of the theorem we proved before, we know that since all these forward edges have, uh, since we know that there is no path in G sub F, we're free to define capital S as the set of vertices that we can reach. But what does it mean that all of the residual capacities of these edges that exit capital S are zero? It means we're using them completely. It means on each of those edges, the flow equals the capacity. Okay. So what's happened here? What's happened is that this was obvious. Okay. But what we've done was show you that actually, if you have a max flow, then I can show you a min cut whose total weight is actually equal to the maximum flow. Right? So I know that this got a little bit, you know, I know that today's lecture looked a little bit more like how my colleagues think a theory class ought to look. Um, so I know that there were some details here. But I hope I hope the overall ideas made sense, even if some of the details flew by. Did they? Yes. So you, you're just uh, redefining the flow in terms of S, which is essentially a partition or a cut. I'm saying that because we know, because we know that the flow is optimal, if and only if there's no longer any path from S to T in this residual graph. That gives us a natural way to define a cut, namely the places that you can get to and everything else. And when we define that and we look at the weight of all the edges crossing it, 
we look at their capacities, we say, well, the boundary of, I mean, S is exactly the place where you come, you know, it's exactly the set where all the edges leading out of it have residual capacity zero, which means you're using them completely, which means the flow there equals the total capacity of those edges, which means the max flow equals that cut. And the nice thing is, because we know that the max flow is less than or equal to the min cut, as soon as I show you a cut whose weight is equal to the max flow, we also know that that's the smallest, right? So here's what's going on. We know that any cut has greater weight than any flow, okay? So as soon as I show you that it's possible for these two to meet, you know that the maximum flow, whatever it is, equals the minimum cut, whatever it is, because this can't happen. Okay. All right. So, shall we take this as given and move on? I'm happy to answer questions if you want. I mean, here in office hours, by email, whatever. I mean, I do this in the book, but I do it fairly briefly. Because, but if you if you want to find a more detailed description and you know, it would make more sense to look at a, a book which is just about algorithms where they're delving more into the detail. But um, actually, I'd be very interested if the proof in the book is clear because I tried to do it clearly but rather briefly and it sounds like it wasn't. Well, good. Well, show me how to improve it. It's either the optimal proof or it can be improved. <laughs> um, if there is a path through your brain of non-zero residual confusion, then we can uh, <laughs> add understanding along that path. Okay, all right. So um, now there's there's something nice. There, there are a couple nice things that I want to talk about here. One is that um, so far, I mean, as of today, it's fair to say that the simplest algorithm for min cut is to find the maximum flow. Okay and then use this method of finding the min cut from the max flow. Now this is a little bit frustrating because it feels as if, you know, so how does the max flow work? It starts out with a flow of zero, and you start looking around for paths on which you can add flow, and you keep improving it, okay? Well, in the same way, it feels as if we ought to be able to start with a huge cut, okay? Buy all the seats on all the airplanes. It's not the minimum cut, but it works. Mm -hmm. And then we should be able to make improvements in that cut, bringing it down towards the minimum cut, sort of mirroring the process that we add flow along paths and bring the flow up to the maximum flow. To my knowledge, no one has found a kind of elegant algorithm that does this, a sort of elegant mirror image to the max flow algorithm. So that's tantalizing because the fact that there is this deep relationship with them suggests that, you know, somehow we should be able to use the same algorithmic idea but from the other side until we meet in the middle. That's one thing which I wanted to say. Um, uh, let's see, was that the main thing I wanted to say? So um, next week we'll talk about this more general thing called duality. It turns out that the relationship between max flow and min cut is just an example of a kind of marriage between a whole bunch of pairs of optimization problems, where one is a maximization problem, the other is a minimization problem, and the max of this turns out to equal the min of that. So there's something deeper going on here than just this particular example of cuts and flows. Um, so, uh, all right. So any other questions about this before I move on? Yes. You're saying that um, in the max flow, you said that uh, things are good about if, it's, if you have polynomial number of uh, of, edge of, uh, of vertices, then it's going to take polynomial time to find the maximum flow. Yeah. And similarly, like we're starting from zero and adding edge, edge, edge. Similarly, in the minimum flow, we're going to start with all the edges and go down, down, down. 
the bridge, the, this is also, don't, can we say that this is also polynomial in case the vertices are polynomial? Uh, well, but I, I don't know of a simple, okay, so I, I honestly don't know of, so for flows, we have this theorem that says yeah. construct the residual graph. If your flow is not optimal, find a path in the graph and it will tell you a way to improve it. I don't know of a similar statement about cuts. So I, I don't know of a similar statement that says either your cut is the minimum possible or here's a simple algorithm that shows you how to improve it. Okay. So at least not anything quite as elegant as this. Assuming you thought this was elegant. Anything I can describe in one lecture is elegant, I think, by definition. All right. <clears throat> now, um, what I want to do, and I don't know if I'll do it all before we end today, I want to describe this more general framework called linear programming and how max flow fits into it. So for this, you need to remember a tiny, tiny bit of your linear algebra, but not very much. So we, before we had these constraints, so one of them is that for each edge, the flow is non-negative. Another is that it's less than or equal to the capacity. Another is, if you don't mind my writing it this way, the sum, uh, sorry, for, for, for any, for all vertices, the sum over all edges in and out of that vertex, the total flow is zero, where I assume you know that, you know, we add the incoming ones and subtract the outgoing ones. Okay? And the goal is to maximize the sum over all the edges that, you know, pointing out from the source of that flow. Okay? We could equally be maximizing the total flow into the destination, either works, because it's conserved in between. All right. Well, this is a kind of classic constrained, constrained optimization problem. There's something I'm trying to maximize. I have a bunch of variables I can play with, namely the flow on each edge. If I have m edges, I have m different variables. But they're constrained in different ways. Okay. Now notice that all these constraints are linear constraints. I mean, this is the, the sum or the difference of a bunch of things. Okay. So what I mean is that the left-hand side of each of these constraints is either a single variable or some linear combination of variables. So let's, let's go back to our little toy example here again. So, and here are our capacities. Excuse me. Thank you. So, and let's call these edges... Um, Let's call the flow along these edges, so I don't have to keep writing F. Let's just call them A, B, C, D, and E. Okay? So the constraints are A is less than or equal to 2, B is less than or equal to 1, C is less than or equal to 2, D, blah, blah, blah. And there are some more constraints. A equals B plus C. B plus D equals E. So actually, come to think of it, it's not, a, because of these constraints, it's not as if all five of these variables are independent. But let's pretend we didn't know that. Okay. And the goal is to maximize uh, A plus D. Okay? Or A plus D. <laughs> Same thing, yeah. Uh, well, A or, or E plus C, yeah. Okay. 
So, um, now, let's see, I, I didn't think I was going to get quite this far. So I, I, have a, I have a nice little example of this stuff cooked up. But um, since it's difficult to draw five-dimensional things, and I can only just barely draw three-dimensional things, let's take advantage of the fact that there are really only three independent variables here. Okay. So, for instance, if I tell you about A and B and, let's say, E, then I've told you everything you need to know. So, or, or A, B, and D will be fine, too. So let's say A, B, and D, because we already know that E equals B plus D, and we already know that C equals A minus B. Okay. Um, we also know, by the way, that because all the flows have to be non-zero, C has to be greater than or equal to zero, so A has to be greater than or equal to B. Okay? I can't have more going this way than came that way. Right? So now here's what I want to say. I want to say that the set of all legal flows forms what is called a polytope, which here is just a little polyhedron, nice three-dimensional thing, where the constraints become the facets of this polytope. So let's just start looking at some examples. So we know that A has to be, uh, these all also have to be greater than or equal to zero. So it means that this back wall, uh, sorry, uh, yes, this back wall here, where A is zero, you can't go past there. So I slice that off. Same thing with this, which says B. So you have to be on this side of that plane, say, because B has to be greater than or equal to zero. You have to be above here. OK, fine. Um, A has to be less than or equal to 2. So here's 1 and 2. So there's also, we can't get farther out than this box out in front here. So let's carve that off. B has to be uh, ah, B has to be less than or equal to one. So let's slice that off. So we're down to this so far. Um, D also cannot be greater than two. That gives us a top to our box. All right. Well, so far this is kind of boring. Um, but let's look at the other one. So E, which is B plus D, has to be less than or equal to 2. Okay? The total flow coming in from B, uh, B and D has to be less than or equal to 2. Well, if you think about it, that is a face that goes like this. So there's 1 and... I cut this off, and I now have this shape. Okay. Let's see what else. Sorry? Uh, can you just repeat this last step again? I could not get to. Uh, so I claim that saying that B plus D, right, we know that B plus D is less than or equal to 2 because that's E. Okay. So what is the plane B plus D equals 2? I claim it cuts down here at 45 degrees across the B and D plane. So we slice that off. We now have a kind of mailbox-shaped thing. Let's clean it up a little bit. Someone once said that geometry is the art of reasoning about perfect objects with imperfect drawings. <laughs> this is definitely an imperfect drawing. All right, and let's see. We also know that A has to be greater than B. And so um, that means that that's a plane 
So we come out at 45 degrees here to this point, 1 comma 1. Yes. Now things start getting interesting. So now <coughs> we're going to cut a sort of trapezoid off the back here like that. Okay. Anyway, hopefully you get the idea. I think we're almost done. Also, C has to be less than or equal to 2, but that actually doesn't give us any more cutting because A was already less than or equal to 2, and C is less than or equal to A. So we're done. This is our polytope. Okay. So any point A comma B comma D, which is inside this little three-dimensional solid, is a legal flow. Well, what's the best one? We want to maximize A plus D. Maximizing A plus D means pushing out in this direction along the AD plane as far as possible. And lo and behold, what's the best one? It's out here where A and D are 2 and 2 and B is 0. And that's the one we know about. Send 2 along here, 0 along there then E is automatically 2, C is automatically 2, and that's our optimal flow. Okay. Where's our little non-optimal <coughs> flow? Well, that's the one where A is 2, B is 1, and D is 1, right? This one, this was our flow of value 3. So B is 1, D is 1, A is 2. It's this corner. Okay. So the flows that we met, these nice integer value flows that we met on our way to the optimal flow are corners of this polytope, <coughs> vertices of this polytope. And our goal is to find the one which is farthest out along a certain direction. In this case, the A plus D direction. All right? Now, there's something called the simplex algorithm. So the simplex algorithm says the following. It says, give me any linear programming problem in the following very general sense. I'm going to have um, an entire vector, which I'll call x, of variables I can play with. In this case, it was originally a five-dimensional vector, although we used some of our knowledge to reduce it to three dimensions. And then you have a set of constraints which we'll write like this. So this says, so A here is a matrix. It has one row for each constraint. The components of C are the right-hand sides of these constraints. Okay. So for instance, if our vector x is uh, a, B, and D, as it is here, what are some of the constraints we had? Well, A is less than or equal to 2. Okay, so fine. The top row just picks out A. We put 2 there. Okay. But um, we also know, for instance, and, the same, and B is less than or equal to 1, and D is less than or equal to two, those are the kind of boring ones. But then, for instance, B plus D, which is E, also has to be less than or equal to two. And that's given by that row of the matrix. Okay? And so on. So you write this all down, and your goal is to maximize <coughs> C dot x for some vector c. In this case, we wanted to maximize a and d, so c equals 1, 0, 1, because this, take the dot product of this with this, and you get a plus d. Okay. So c is the vector that you're trying to get out in that direction as far as possible. a is the matrix of constraints. b is the right-hand sides of the constraints. And this general type of problem is called a linear programming problem. 
All right? And it shows up all the time in industry and all sorts of search and optimization problems, manufacturing and scheduling and planning and all sorts of stuff. And as you can see, it's a very general way to talk about constrained optimization problems. But certainly, max flow fits into here. Okay. Now, what does the simplex algorithm do? It says, well, figure out what your polytope is. This could be a high dimensional space. It could have many facets. So there can be difficult problems there. But start at any corner you like. Now, remember. What we said in max flow is that you can tell that either you're at the best possible place or you can tell a way to improve it. Okay. Well, what's going to happen? If I'm here, I might notice that I'm at a corner of the polytope. There are various edges that I could move along to move to another corner. If each of these edges <coughs> leads me sort of back down along the C direction and makes things worse, then I know that I'm at the optimum. But if any of these edges leads upward, where <coughs> upward means in the C direction, here in this direction, <coughs> then I move along that edge. And I now am at a new corner of the polytope. And I simply crawl up the polytope trying to get as, as high as possible. So for instance, I might start by doing this. Let's just see what flow this is. Here, D is 0, and A and B are both 1. Oh, that's a perfectly reasonable flow. It means this one. Okay. Now I explore again. What can I do? I could go this way or this way. Let's suppose I go this way. Well, that corresponds to adding this flow so that now this is 2 and 1. Because now B is still 1. Now A is 2, D is still 0. I again look at all the corners I could move along. Maybe I do this. Ah, now D is 1. That's our little value 3 flow. And finally, I look around and I realize that I can move along this direction and make things even better. And that corresponds to doing this, undoing that, and adding one there. So the improvements in the flow caused by adding flow along these paths correspond exactly to moving along the edges of this polytope. Okay? And the theorem we proved that says you can either tell you're at the optimum or you can see a way to improve it corresponds exactly to the fact that you're, you're you know, sort of orient yourself so that the C direction is up you can either tell just by looking locally whether moving along any of the edges <coughs> of the polytope would move you farther up and improve things even more. If you can, do so and try again. If you can't, you found the optimum. Okay. So it turns out that any problem of this kind, and this is called linear programming or LP for short, Linear programming is in P. And this was actually not proved for quite a while. Okay? People <coughs> knew about the simplex algorithm. But they said, well, the problem is these high dimensional polytopes, these jewels, can have many, many facets. And in fact, there are examples where taking one step at a time, if you're not careful, takes you an exponential number of tiny, tiny steps, kind of walking around and around the outside of the polytope until you get to the best vertex at the top. Right? And it wasn't until, I think, the 1950s that uh, actually a much more complicated algorithm was, was proved to work in polynomial time. And then it wasn't until the 80s that there was an algorithm which was both theoretically good, provably polynomial time and practically good that you know it was actually implementable and ran quickly and at this point there are things better than the simplex algorithm there are what are called interior point methods that do a walk in this you know like it sounds in the interior of this polytope and do a kind of smooth walk towards the optimum um, 
But so any, any problem which can be stated in terms of linear programming is in P. And we will use this problem later on um, when we come up with approximation algorithms for some things. So any questions? I guess I'm out of time, but any quick questions? Good. Have a good weekend. Yes. This max flow is only for one source and one sink. So I'm just like the, the all pairs shortest path can be. Is there any algorithm for all pairs max flow? Oh, sure. So, so the question is about max flow with um, multiple sources and multiple destinations. There's something called multi commodity flow. Okay. Um, but it is actually noticeably harder than max flow. It, it's not a simple generalization. <coughs> I should have, yes, so I'll, I'll try to say this again. Well, 